Lord Jesus, what a privilege and a pleasure to be called your kids. You're just constantly at work in every one of our hearts. If we're willing and we respond, you do miraculous and amazing things. And today as we celebrate Miss Christie's story, it is no different than that. And so we just wanna celebrate um, your transformative work, your redeeming work. And we ask God that you would, you would bless somebody that would be listening with this testimony, just to know in their heart that there's hope for change, there's hope for transformation. And so we just give you this time and pray you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. I just wanna say welcome to you first, Miss Christy. We are so thankful that you're willing to be vulnerable and share and just be honest about what God's been up to in your <laughs> life and it has been a journey. Yeah. And we we decided to do a love church story podcast to first and foremost honor God, but also to give people hope to increase their faith and to let them know like God's in the business of doing some work here. So I just thought it would be so good and so fun to have you on just to share like it's been a journey for you, but it has been wild and so much fun to watch the power of God in your life. Yeah. So if you don't mind, if you could kind of just start us off with, it's really fun to kind of catch people up with what childhood looked like and maybe being raised in your home felt like. If you could catch us up on and give us the like synopsis of your history from whatever you want, zero to maybe like your college age, that would be a great place to get going here. Yeah. yeah so I grew up with my mom and dad um, married. Uh, my little brother came into the picture when I was seven. Um, I mean, I was a pretty easy kid. School came easy to me. I played sports. I was in dance. But there was this, <clears throat> um, like, crisis in our family that was always hanging over us because my dad was a, I mean, a raging alcoholic. There wasn't a day that went by that there wasn't alcohol in the mm. system. Um, and which led to my mom trying to cover this crisis with so much codependency where mm. if he's okay, we're okay. If he's not okay, we're not okay. Mm. And so there was always eggshells that we walked on which then caused me to not want to let anybody have control over me because my dad had so much control over our family for so long. Wow. And so I watched this as I walked through high school and, or middle school and high school, and I did everything I could to get his attention. I was like, if I can be top of the class, if I can do the sports, if I can be the best dancer, if I can do all these things, he'll show up. And he didn't. I mean, he, he never showed up. He worked very hard. I mean, if we got our work ethic from anyone, it was my dad. He went to work every day. He never missed a day. He was a functioning alcoholic. Wow. And we grew up in that, and that's what we knew. And then as we got closer to, as I got closer to graduation, I was like, I'm running. I'm going as far away as possible. And my parents said no. They gave me one option for college, which was College of the Ozarks in Branson, Missouri. And that was not where I wanted to go. There's a interview process and everything you can possibly find uh, to get into this college. And I passed everything with flying colors, even though I tried so hard to not. I mean, <laughs> I tried to be their least favorite candidate. And they were like, we're so excited to have you. And I was angry. I, I mean, I was mad. And I didn't know the Lord growing up. But I mean, at that point, it was one of those where it was like, I, why would I even trust in God? I mean, you're sending me to this Christian college you are not practicing. I mean, we didn't know the Lord. There was pieces of it in our lives. We had people around us forever that continued to plant seeds, but there was never a relationship. I didn't know who he was, but I did know that everything I didn't want to happen was happening. <laughs> so at that point, I was like, well, I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to believe in anything. I'm just going to go and do whatever I want. Oh, and that's actually the setup for this question, because <laughs> the next question that I had for you is clue us in on why rebellion or rebellious Christie, yeah, right, came to be and like why it started going on. I kind of feel like we got a little bit of a glimpse, but even more so in college, yeah. there was a journey for you. And and I know you you mentioned just a few things that had happened, but if you can tell us like college life and move us into what it led to yeah. when you came back. Yeah. So my first day of college, I met my roommate. She was a pastor's daughter. Oh. And the first thing she said to me was, do you party? And I was like, no, I never partied. I was the kid that sat at home in high school and cried because my friends were all out partying because I was so worried about him because I had made so many promises I would never be like my dad. Mm. And at that point, I was like, what good is that? <laughs> what good is that doing me? Sure, let's go. And it was downhill into destruction from there. Um, I promptly got accepted into College of the Ozarks. And by the end of the first semester, I was one of the first students to be kicked out. 
the dean of the college was my roommate's uncle. And so he had the privilege of <laughs> telling us we weren't allowed to come back. Wow. And so um, it was like exactly what I wanted, though. Like I wanted a reason to leave and I got it. And so I was like, OK, I get to do whatever I want now. And from there, it just led me to this path of destruction, finding all of the friends that I never needed. <laughs> but I clearly thought I wanted because I was getting attention. I became obnoxious. I mean, I wanted to be the center of attention all the time. I was loud. Everybody wanted me around. I had this name of party girl all through these years. And so, I mean, it led me from Missouri and it took me to Alabama and it took me to Florida, but I would always come back to Omaha. And every time I would come back to Omaha, I would end up in a jail cell, a literal jail cell. That's exactly what I was going to ask you. This <laughs> lifestyle yeah. that became very common to you led to a certain set of circumstances yeah. over and over and over. It was cyclical yeah. for you. You kind of found found yourself, like you just said, in and out of jail cells. Tell us what put you there yeah. and how um, how God was grabbing your attention. I know it was a journey, but tell us a little bit about what that looked like. Yeah. So I got my first DUI <laughs> when I was 20 years old. Um, I thought nothing of it. it. It was like, it was no big deal. All the people I hung around with all the DUIs. So when I got the DUI, you know, I got it and then I was done with it. We all high-fived and we moved on. Wow. Um, I got diversion for that first DUI. So that DUI was actually taken off my record. And how old were you here? Uh, 20. That was right, right around 20. Yeah. So before I was 21, like I'd already been through diversion. And so then I got my next DUI when I was 22. And with that one, I got 30 days jail time. Still, for whatever reason, didn't even phase me. Like, they would, it wouldn't phase me. When I would go through this, I'd be like, I'm just going to go through the motions, do what I have to do. I never stopped any of the things I was doing. I just found ways to manipulate my way through all of it. And for whatever reason, it worked every time. Mm. Third DUI, same thing. I, I mean, I just manipulated my way through it. I got probation for this one. I was like, okay, great. I don't even have to do jail time. That's great. Fourth UI rolls around, they give me more jail time. I'm then on probation even more. And then I get the fifth UI and I was like, man, this is crazy. I just keep getting in trouble, but I just keep getting away with things. Like even the jail time pieces that I would get would just be a slap on the wrist in my mind. Like that's where I was. But I was so depressed. <laughs> I mean, I was so depressed. I was so lost. I found comfort in people I didn't know. I would much rather be in a room with a ton of people I didn't know than with anybody that knew me. I was like comfortably numb in destruction and chaos. Like that's just where I sat and that's where I was comfortable. And it's where I thrived for a long time. After that fifth DUI, I kind of got my life together a little bit. <laughs> um, through this process, after my third DUI, I met my first husband um, and I ended up moving to Florida. Um, when I went to Florida, it was just to visit this guy that I was dating. And um, my mom said, don't go and marry him. So I went and I married him. And we should have never been married. It was a, at the end of it, we can look at it and say it was definitely a contract marriage. He was in the military. I was a friend. He could make more money. We could, I could live in Florida. I could be drunk on the beach all the time. And he was just going to provide a place for me to live and insurance. That seems great when, you know, you're a 20 something that doesn't want to be home. And doesn't Omaha know the Lord. And doesn't know the Lord. I, I did not know the Lord. Now, throughout my life, like I said, there's people that have been in my life that have, tried to grab my attention and have planted seeds and praise the Lord that they are still part of my life today right. because I don't know why anybody would want to be part of my life after being part of the destruction mm. that I was in. But in 2006, um, my ex and I decided like it was time, like I had to go. It was December of, two, of 2006 and I moved back to Omaha. This um, is all before Christ. And this is all before Christ. And I moved back to Omaha. Um, I had to, I was like, it was time to go. Like my husband and I at the time were fighting, screaming matches. I mean, we were both always drunk. There was no reason for us to be together. So I came back to Omaha in December of 2006 and I started working with AT&T and I was training for them. I was in mobile. I was traveling all the time, but I came back to Omaha and found all my old friends. And so I became a functioning alcoholic. I became a functioning addict. I mean, at this time, there was cocaine, there was weed, there was, I mean, anything you can imagine, mm. I was part of it. Um, this is kind of not only cyclical, but then also generational. Generational, 100%. Mm -hmm. All the things I said I'd never be, I was and then some. Mm. Like, it was like, I'll show you, I'll do it even better. And that's where I let, and that's where I was for a long time. Um, 
And then in October of 2007, I got pretty sick. Uh, I'd gone out drinking. We were pretty sure I had alcohol poisoning. I was like, I don't know, but I can't go out tonight. I have to stay home. I'm so sick. And uh, <laughs> I called my mom and said, can you take me to the emergency room? Something is wrong with me. I'm not one to go to the doctor. I don't want to go to the doctor, but I knew something was wrong. I went, they were like, oh, her appendix are bursting or she has a kidney stone. They put a morphine drip in my arm. Three morphine drips later, they came in and said, get the morphine drip out of her arm. She's pregnant. <laughs> and I was like, I'm what? How am I pregnant? Mm. And in the moment, I was like, well, what is happening? Like, there's no way. Maybe I'm still drunk. Like, what's happening? They took me upstairs for an ultrasound and they could see the baby, but they could not find a heartbeat. And they said all the organs were on the outside. And I audibly said, thank God, mm. there's no way I can take care of anyone else. I can't even take care of myself. And then at that moment, they said, well, there's the heartbeat. <laughs> and about six hours later, I was in labor and I had my son, Caleb, who I think everybody probably knows. <laughs> wow. um, and so, I mean, complete miracle should not have should not have even been able to take him home with me. I was so honest with them when they asked me the questions about my usage. Social worker never even came and saw me. I mean, talk about the Lord's hand being all over this kid. I mean, they said the organs are on the outside of his body. When he was born, his, his placenta was calcified to his back. That's all it was. I mean, he was perfect. He sang for days in the NICU or in the um, nursery. No one let him sleep at night. They're like, he just talks to us all night. <laughs> so, I mean, he was vocal from go, but... Um, when he was born, a double rainbow was over the hospital. And so my mom and our friend Denise, and uh, we always say that he's he's a miracle. I mean, he was, Absolutely. he is what saved me. I don't know where I would have ended up had I not had him because I still went back out. I, I was good for about a month. I was like, okay, I can do this. I'm taking this kid home. We're, we're going to be okay. And I made it about a month and I was like, whoa, I'm yeah. overwhelmed, overstimulated. Here's your grandma. I'm out. Mm. And I went right back into wow. my destruction. Wow. Um, I want to read this verse to you. <laughs> I know you know where I'm going. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I'll get through it, but I'm going to read it. It says, the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go down to the potter's shop and I will speak to you there. So I did as he told me and found the potter working at his wheel, but the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay and again started over. Then the Lord gave me this message. Oh, Israel, can I not do to the, do, sorry, my eyes are watering, cannot do to you as this potter has done to this clay, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so you yeah. are yeah. in my hand. This is about when life starts to transition huh, yeah. for you. So why don't yeah. you clue us in on just com coming from where you just were, what happened next? Yeah. And how did God grab your attention? Yeah. So um, I went back right back into destruction. And I avoided being a mom. I left him at home with my mom all the time. I mean, I was so checked out. I had no idea where I was going. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was not happy where I was. Um, but this led me to my sixth DUI. And my first DUI had been written off with diversion, but because it was aggravated, they, they booked me for my sixth DUI. We will later see the Lord lowered it to my fifth DUI is what I was, is what I was convicted of. Um, and it was at that point that something had to change. And so this would have been February of 2011. And, um, I was just in a very dark place and I got this DUI and I end up in jail once again in a jail cell. And I knew something had to be different. And I called my parents and I said, do not bail me out. Leave me here. I, I'm not learning anything. I'm not getting better, just leave me. And I was there for 24 hours. I got my bond hearing and my dad bailed me out. Mm. And I was really angry with him. I was like, what are you doing? Why are you bailing me out? And he said, I couldn't leave you there. I couldn't leave you in a jumpsuit. And so I isolated because the one thing you're never supposed to do when you're on the news is read the comments. And I read every one of them. And the sad part is, is I believed every one of them. Mm -hmm and that I shouldn't be a mom. They should take my son away, that I should rot in jail forever. And at that point I felt that way. I was like, no, they're right, I should. And because everything was so public, 
I knew that I had two choices. I was either going to be really public about the journey I was going to take from this point on, Mm -hmm. or I was going to just be a hermit for the rest of my life and never come out. And so I decided to put myself in treatment and I enrolled in April and I walked in and I sat down and she said, I'm going to need your phone. I'm going to need this. I'm going to need this. And I stood up and walked out. I was like, I'm not ready. So in June of 2011, I walked in. I said, don't ask me any questions. Just take my stuff and tell me where my room is. And I spent the first two weeks in tears. I couldn't talk. I got to wear the really cool sign that said, ask me my name. So people would actually talk to me. Um, And it was about the third week. And Ty and Terry Schenzel came into the treatment facility I was at and just spoke and told their story and just to give us hope and then asked me to stay after, to which I was like, what now? (laughs) And they said, we just wanted to invite you to church. We just wanted to invite you to church. And I was like, well, I'm stuck in this facility, so if there's a way to get out, (laughs) might as well. And so I went to Calvary at Millard North for the first time in July of 2011. And then in August of 2011 was when I walked forward for the altar call. And it was in 2011 when I met the Lord. Mm. That was when he started to really take hold. And through this process, I really started to see my life change. I had people around me. I was in a small group. Like, I felt like I wasn't alone. Right. Tell me a little bit about how Jeremiah 18 this week relates to yeah the moment that brought you there. And that's really what's happening. God, like, completely began yeah. to transform, yeah, as completely. you're alluding to. Yeah, completely began to transform me. So when I was in, so I did get sentenced to prison for my fifth DUI. Um, a total surprise to me because through this process, I had actually like done everything I was supposed to do and they had cut a deal and I was going to get to just do all of my time at home and I was going to be on SAS probation. And I mean, we had all things worked out with the state, but I walked in um, in February of 2012 before the judge and he said, I can't, I can't send you home. I'm not helping you. I'm sentencing you to York for 18 to 24 months. And that morning I had dropped Caleb off at daycare and I had told him that I would be back later and he didn't see me for three months after that. And so it was in those three months that I was sitting in Douglas County waiting to be transferred to York that I was like, what am I supposed to do? And Eunice um, brought me a Bible and I started to read the Bible, and when I got transferred to York, I was put in d and and I was in a room by myself, which is God's grace all over the place, because you're never by yourself in d and which is diagnosis and evaluation. But he um, led me to Jeremiah 18, and I read that passage for probably three days. But I was at this point where it was like I was laying flat on my back, staring at the ceiling of a cement wall like room and I was like something has to change and I'm reading this I'm like I don't understand I don't understand I don't understand and he started to really break down my walls he started to really show me that I was that clay and that the sin was there before but he can take it away but I felt like I couldn't be forgiven like I had I just had so I'd done so much I was just so rotten I mean I grew up thinking how horrible my parents were. And I think now I'm like, man, I was so horrible to my parents. I was so horrible to the people around me. And I lied and I stole and I cheated. I mean, it didn't matter. I was so manipulative. And so I walked through this season of prison. And I mean, I was terrified. I mean, I was terrified. I like didn't want to talk to anybody. And it was at that point that I really lost my voice. Like I stopped talking. I stopped interacting with people I just kept to myself and I read my bible and I read books and I walked like Mm. that's all I did did you believe or did you hope that this was true I hoped that it was true I didn't I didn't know it enough to believe it it's like I knew it but I didn't know it yeah and so um I ended up being transferred to work release in Lincoln and then work release in Omaha and then I finally got to go home for my last couple months mm. on work or on a house arrest. And it was at that point, I was like, okay, I met the Lord before. I had small groups who were writing me letters. I mean, I was getting letters every day. I spent my 30th birthday in prison and I got so many cards. I mean, there were so many people that were just pouring love into me 
at a point where I thought that no one could love me or should love me. And then I get home and I'm like, okay, I'm going to go back to church. But I had to have an invitation from the church to come because I was still a ward of the state because I was a felon Mm -hmm. and I was in prison. And for whatever reason, I like couldn't get a response from Calvary. And I was like, why don't they want me back? Why don't they? But they said they'd want me back. They said it was okay. And I was determined that like, I was like, nope, they don't want me. And so right there, I was like, well, I'm not being accepted there. And so I already walked into this with this preconceived notion that like, this is all a hoax. Like, this is all a lie. These people aren't real. And so Denise and Roger Friesen, who have been friends of our family for a very long time, said that they would take me to church. They got me a letter and I walked into their church with them and they put me into their gospel community. And these people loved me so well, but I was already so jaded and I was so set that somebody was just making me a project that just wanted me to do it their way. I mean, my rebellion just continued to to flare up that I walked away. Hmm. I was like, forget this. And once again, I walked right back to where I had been before. And I thought that I, you know, was doing so much better. I thought that I was done with it. I thought that, and it was easy to go back to where I was comfortable, to what I knew. And so I walked back into it and I sat in it for about a year with so much anxiety, more anxiety than I ever experienced. Like I would try to walk into a bar and I would have a panic attack and I'd have to like go back out of the car and pep talk myself to even walk in to see these people that you know, which supposedly wanted me there. Really? I mean, you said yes to Jesus. The Holy Spirit was living inside yeah. you, even though the flesh you were working out, you're, you're working yourself out of, right? Yeah. And so it's it's such a testimony to, there's too much God in you for you to enjoy <laughs> the world. And there's too much world in you for you to like say so yes. yes fully, right? So yes. It's so cool though, to watch how patient he is with us yeah. in the journey of surrender, yeah. right? Because there's that first time like, yes. And now, Speed us up to where the second time yes was, and then thereafter, what God has been doing doing in the way of transformation yeah. since. Yeah. So in 2014, um, I met Josh, my husband now, um, and he came home from work. We we did not start our relationship correctly. We immediately moved in together. Immediately moved our kids together. Um, so we're blending this family. We're living in the world. We're both in probably still one of the darkest seasons either either of us have ever had, trying to like keep our heads above water. He comes home from work one day and says, I think God's missing. We've never talked about God. Like, <laughs> I was like, did you lose him? Like, I didn't know what else to ask. I wasn't understanding. I knew he'd grown up Catholic and that, so as we talked, like he wanted to pursue God. We didn't know what that looked like, but we were, I was like, okay, let's do it. Which right there we can now say is a huge testament because I am (laughs) rebellious and don't like to be told what to do. But I was like, okay, like this is what I'm supposed to do. So we started this journey and I kept asking if we could just try Calvary. Can we just try Calvary? And he was like, nope, we're not going there. Nope, we're not going there. This is what we're doing. And I was like, okay, this is what we'll do. And um, it would have been in April of 2015. And we went to church and we walked out not feeling great. I mean, it was definitely, we were we were told repeatedly that we'll never be good enough and you're just gonna have to keep working not for it. Not Calvary. No, not Calvary. A liturgical style yeah, church. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then um, I said, can we just try Calvary? And he said, yes, we'll try your weird church. <laughs> and I said, okay. And so that next Sunday, uh, we got to Millard North. There was still construction, so we came in the back doors. There was music blaring. Lois met us at the door. Come in the back doors. Go figure. Prophetic. We'll yeah. talk about that yeah. in a minute. <laughs> yeah. We come in the back doors. Uh, Lois is standing there and hugs Josh, like hugs all of us as we're walking like down the hallway towards the auditorium. We were late also. Um, and Josh is like, I don't know what this is. This is so weird. There's loud music. This woman just hugged me. We're in a high school. This is not church. What are we doing? So it was full and you stood where? <laughs> yeah. So we walk in. There's no seats. So we stood right next to the production booth, right next to front of house. And that's where we stood the entire encounter. <laughs> and the first thing that PT said as he came out on stage was, you'll never, you'll never be good enough. You know, you'll never earn it. The opposite yeah. of what you were hearing. Yeah, well, no, exactly what we were hearing at first, actually. And then he said, yeah. it's a gift. Yeah. It's a free gift. And I watched Josh just break. And it was like exactly what he needed to hear. And like I had said, I had already met the Lord in 2011. But it was at that point, like, I knew something was changing in us. 
But um, one week later, Josh responded to the altar call and went out to NICU hallway and was prayed over and asked what the next steps were. And they said an easy form and the easy form was filled out before he was back out front to meet us. And we did face to faces the next week and we've been all in since that point in time. And then um, in October of 2016 um, is when I, like the Lord finally broke through. And I mean, it was just like, I had to literally smash so many idols. I had to like smash so many idols and let so many things go to allow the Lord to really take what was so broken. I mean, I was so broken and let him help to heal me. And in 2016 of October, I I was done. I was like, there's nothing else I can do. And I walked forward and Vanessa Moore and Emily Peters prayed over me. And I remember it was at that point, I was like, nope, this is it. Like, I don't want to turn around anymore. I want to, I want to go on this path that I'm on right now. And so I just started walking and I had so many women that came around me and we had a small group that loved us through all of our crap. <laughs> and uh, it was so sweet. And then we got married in November yeah. of 2016 and we got baptized right before we got married. And we've just seen the Lord do something so beautiful in our lives. I mean, we went from being the two most selfish people you could have ever met to being these two people that just love people so much. Yeah. And we've experienced so much freedom in our life and in our family that we can't help but just want to like be with people and yes. to just help them through that and to just give them hope. It's so clear to me, like two things, three things you said I want to just hit on really quick. One, the moment of, okay, uh, uh, just the seeds that God has planted all the way throughout your life. Yeah. The very first seeds with people like Denise Friesen mm -hmm. all the way through to her Bible study, writing you letters, you yeah. know, through to these girls coming around you and your small group thereafter. Yeah. If you would, um, for those maybe that might be listening, because part of this is really just asking the Lord to use testimony to help others. How important do you believe it is for people to be surrounded? Oh, it's 100% the most important thing because it's important for us to have accountability. It's important for us to be loved and to be surrounded and to let people know us because if we're not letting people know us, we're so prone to isolate. I mean, that's the devil's tactic and everything. If he can pull us out of community, right. he can whisper all the lies into our head. And he whispers the lies when we're in community. So when we're outside of community, we then believe him. We don't even have anything to help us combat that. That's right. And so if we have his armor on at all times and we know what we're supposed to be doing, that's one thing. But when we have people around us on the days where we're falling short, they're able to lift us up and hold us up. And we've experienced that so much in our walk. It's so fun. I just want to brag on God through your family and what God has been doing in you guys since, because I know we're running out of time here, but this is one thing that I think is so sweet. You you say you get to love people now, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think it's funny that in the picture of your testimony, you kept running back and cycling back to quote unquote prison. Yeah. And then God would open up a door, bring you through that, and now he has completely set you free. Yeah. But why is that prophetic in your ministry? Why is the hallway and the production booth prophetic in like you and your husband's ministry? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. So fast forward to now, Josh is the production director at Love Church. <laughs> and through the back doors. And through like, the back doors where we come in. <laughs> <laughs> and then the NICU hallway is part of marriage ministry and next steps and just helping, we get to come alongside people as they're taking those first steps and terrified and feel like their heads are still underwater. We get to be that group of people that just lift them up and help them along the way and tell them they're not alone. And I think that that's the biggest thing is that you don't have to be alone through any of it. That's right. Tell us a little bit about the cell. When people are stuck in bondage and then become set free, what ministry do you guys do there? Yeah, yeah. and so we have the privilege of serving in Fresh Start and being leaders there. Um, the whole reason we even started in Fresh Start was for Caleb. We wanted him fixed, and the Lord did something really radical <laughs> in Josh and I, and we never left. Um, and we've had the privilege to go to Botswana, and we've had the privilege to go to Guatemala, and we have the privilege of sitting with people right here at Love Church all the time and throughout the community. And, I mean, it's very often that we sit in a jail cell with the door open, but we stay in it for That's a really right. long time. And so just helping people find that the chains aren't aren't theirs to be there. Like, God doesn't want those chains on you, and He'll right. remove them, and you just have to be brave enough to step out of the cell. In the same way that you had to take steps, yeah, right, of faith in order to turn, and, and He was there 
ready and yep. willing the yeah. whole time. <laughs> yeah. and, and you get to now encourage others in that. And it's so sweet to watch because you're so very passionate about it. And finally, I just think it's so cool. There's a verse that I want to end with here in Romans 8. And I was reminded of it when you told um, the story of how these ladies would write you letters when you were in prison and you would receive all these encouragements. A, you didn't believe it and you didn't understand why. Why would yeah. they love me when I wasn't deserved of love, right? Like yeah. I didn't deserve to be loved the way they were loving me. And really, you just think about brothers and sisters around the globe that are willing to be God's hands and feet. And and really, it's a challenge today to every person out there that knows somebody in need, knows somebody that's struggling. Like, you have no idea what a letter might mean. Yeah. You know, you have no idea what a word of encouragement might mean, speaking life over or a hug. And these yeah. women were encouraging you that way. And as you were sharing, I was reminded of this verse in Romans 8 where it says, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Yeah. Neither death, nor life, nor neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell yeah. can separate us from God's love, although the enemy tried yes, he did. to get your full attention. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our yeah. Lord. Do you believe that to be 100%. true? 100%. Yes. <laughs> Through your testimony. Yeah. yeah. It's I very mean, evident. Without that, I mean, even just back to like my dad for a second. I mean, I was essentially estranged from him for like 39 years. Like we saw each other. We hated each other. I mean, we were horrible to each other and just constantly picking on each other. I mean, it, it was never, there was never a relationship. Mm -hmm. And then um, because of the Lord and what he did, I then got the privilege to sit with my dad in his last days and help him to know the Lord. Come on. And so we've just gotten to see things go full circle. I mean, I was able to know my dad in a way I'd never known him. And I mean, I couldn't have done that without the Lord. Right. The way that he's not just in the business of transforming your life. No. But those around you, yeah. right? Like, isn't it incredible that he would allow us to be on the front lines of other people's lives and yeah. encourage them along their journey? Well, Christy, I am so blessed to be your sister. I'm so proud of the way that you surrender day-to-day, moment-to-moment. You're our number one prayer. I want to call you a prayer cheerleader, <laughs> but prayer warrior, because you're always cheering us on yeah. via prayer and text. And, and it's cool, too, like the redemptive story between you and your son you know, you and your dad. It's just so cool to see God's hand yeah. in the way um, he's in the business of transformation. Yes, he is. So if you maybe would think about a listener who might be like young rebellious Christy to mm -hmm. now transform, set free and giving yeah. all she's got to the Lord, how would you encourage that one listening? And would you pray for somebody that might be listening in Yeah, that's in that state? Yeah, I would say more than anything, just don't be scared what anybody else thinks. I was searching for approval from everyone else and I had no idea what I was actually searching for, for and I just was paralyzed in fear of what will anybody think if I take this step. Come on. And so in the moments where it feels like no one will understand, God understands. And so I always say you can believe in faith or you can believe in fear. Both require you to believe in something that hasn't happened yet. And so I say choose faith every mm -hmm. time. Surrender. Yeah, right? surrender. I love it. Would you do us the blessing of praying for anybody listening in who might be finding themselves in similar circumstances yeah. or just need to take a step of faith today. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for being with us. Thank you. Yeah, Heavenly Father, I just, I thank you. I thank you for transformation. I thank you for your long suffering alongside us. Lord, I thank you for every step that we take. You're with us. Lord, I just want to pray for the one, the one who is watching this now and knows that something needs to change, but is so scared too, Lord. I just ask that you would break down walls, that you would break chains, and that you would bring freedom. Lord, I know you can do so much with a willing heart. So just a yes, just a yes that they want to listen. Lord, I know that you can do so much. Lord, I pray that you would bring community around them, and I pray that you would give them a boldness to step into an environment where they can heal. Lord, it's easy for us to sit where we were and where it's comfortable. It's easy to be complacent. But Lord, I know that you have so much more for us when we are willing to step in obedience to where you call us. So Lord, I just ask that you would take hold of hearts. Lord, would you mine the gold out that is there? Would you till the soil of their hearts? Would you help us to recognize what you don't want us to carry any longer and what you want to take from us? Because Lord, we know 
that we can sit on that wheel and we can go around and around and around and be one turn from destruction, but we are only one arm length away from your Amen. redemption. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank Amen. you for being such a blessing thank you. to our listeners. I pray that it increased their faith today. It did. <laughs>